In step 2, we establish a definition for the process we are measuring and a standard against which we'll compare the performance. Now in step 3, we are ready to record the current performance of the process by creating a data collection plan, evaluating the measurement system we use, and properly recording the results. We come away from this step with valid data in a format that is ready for analysis in step 4. Click Next to continue. When you've completed this step, you'll know the purpose of a data collection plan and will have established one for the commercial loan sales case. You'll know the meaning of several terms related to measurement system analysis, and you'll recognize possible sources of variation in a measurement system. You'll be able to use the measurement system analysis checklist to guide your validation of a data source. And in preparation for the analyze phase, you'll become familiar with the software used to record and analyze data. Click Next to continue. A data collection plan is the first step towards gathering accurate data. Its intent is to provide a clear, documented strategy for collecting reliable data. It gives all team members involved in the measurement process a common reference. And it also helps to ensure that resources are used effectively to collect only data that is critical to the project. In some cases, new data collection might not be the only option. Look for any historical data that is available and consider the benefits of new data versus the costs of the collection process. Click Next and let's talk about our data collection plan for commercial loan sales. Well, talk about timing. Siggy just left me a very important message. Click on the message button of the phone to hear it. Hey there, Professor Mark. Do you remember when the sales manager referred to some research that GE did on the loan application process? When they found that 48 hours was a good performance target? Well, it seems that they collected several data samples on loan application processing time over a period of one year. Thought this information might be useful to you in the green belt. I'll send the data on over to you. If the data turns out to be valid, it would save us considerable time and money to use it instead of conducting another study. In order to determine the validity of the data, you need to first evaluate how the measurements were taken. We call this process measurement system analysis. We'll come back to the case in a few minutes. First, click Next to learn about data. potential problems Let's revisit with the, measurement the concept system. of variation. Remember that in a perfect world, a process is done exactly the same way every time and every product that comes off an assembly line is identical. But in the real world, we have variation or differences from the ideal. In a Six Sigma project, the variation we find in the process is called actual process variation. Our ultimate project goal is to reduce that variation, thus satisfying our customers' needs. So at this step in the measure phase of DMAIC, we measure the output of the actual process. It is the output of the measurement process that becomes our data. But collecting the measurement is a process itself, with the same potential for variation. Just like a scale on a production line might be slightly off, the equipment used to measure the loan application data entry time might be off. Actually, this variation in your measurement process can come from a few sources. The gauge or device used to measure, the operator of the device, and other less common sources, such as the environment in which the measurement takes place. There's Siggy again. Click on, in other words, to get his version, and then click Next to apply this model to our commercial loan sales case. Instead of telling you how it relates, I'd like you to relate that diagram you just saw to our case. Here are the processes and some examples of potential variation in our commercial loan sales case. Drag these items to the appropriate place on the Variation Sources diagram. Great job! Click Next, and we'll drill down a bit further on types of gauge variation. There are three types of errors that can result from the gauge. Accuracy, precision, and resolution. 
In this context, those words may have a somewhat different meaning than expected, so I'll walk through an explanation. Let's address accuracy and precision first by looking at the analogy of a target. The circle here represents the ideal performance of a measurement instrument. These dots represent the outcomes from a precise instrument, but not an accurate one. Because they are very close together in the same area, you can assume that the behavior of the instrument is predictable, but unfortunately, it's predictably not inside the circle where you want it. These dots represent the outcome from an accurate system, but not a precise one. They are all arranged around the center of your circle, so the results are all close to the target, but they are quite distant from one another, so no precision here. Finally, these dots represent outcomes from a precise and accurate instrument. They are close together, so the instrument is precise and inside the circle, so they are accurate. With a precise and accurate instrument, you get consistent results within the appropriate range. Problems with accuracy can be addressed by calibration of the instrument. Problems with precision can be addressed using a method called gauge R&R, which we'll talk about shortly. Click Next to learn about the third gauge error. Now, let's take a third variation type for a gauge, resolution. Here, you see a ruler. Imagine you are supposed to measure the length of paper clips with it, and your target length is 1.234 inches. Would this be a good instrument for collecting the measurement? The answer is decidedly no. Because the ruler does not have fine enough increments, the only items you could accurately measure with this ruler would be those falling at the exact inch marks. In other words, the resolution of the instrument is too low to collect accurate data. Phew, I'm tired. While I take a rest, why don't you see how Siggy explains these gauge error concepts by clicking In Other Words? Then click Next to continue. Time to apply these terms to some real-world problems. For each gauge problem shown, indicate whether it is an accuracy, precision, or resolution error. Click Done when you are finished to see the results. Nice job! You've been able to transfer those concepts to some real-life examples. I think you're ready to look at the gauges used in your own projects with a critical eye. Click Next to get back to our assignment for Siggy. Now that you know the ways a measurement system can be responsible for variation, let's get back to the loan sales assignment. We're going to conduct an evaluation of the measurement system that was used to collect that application processing data. The measurement system analysis checklist will guide us through our assessment. The first couple of items look at the measurement procedure. We need to use the same procedure for our measurement system test that was used in the collection of the original data. Let's double check the operational definition and collection procedure with the sales manager. Click Next while I see if I can get in touch with her. I have the sales manager on the line. Based on the operational definition she provides, We'll write the procedures for the measurement system test. Click on her picture to get her input on the procedure used, and then click Next to continue. The next few items from the checklist prompt us to consider what we already know about the system. Answers to these questions are found in a variety of ways, depending on the tool used. In our case, the instrument is a well-calibrated timestamp with the guaranteed precision and accuracy from the manufacturer. It measures to the second, so the resolution is more than sufficient based on our 24 to 72 hour specifications. Now that you know the procedure to follow and some details about the instrument, it's time to conduct the study of the measurement system 
to confirm that the procedures are correctly interpreted and the gauge is indeed reliable. Click Next to continue. Before we talk about the tests themselves, we need to answer the question, what are we testing for? In two words, the answer is repeatability and reproducibility. Repeatability means looking at variation within one component of the process. This is also known as equipment variation because it is most often evaluating if one operator measured the same items several different times with the same instrument, did the instrument produce the same measurements. Reproducibility means testing variation across the process. This is also known as appraiser variation because it is most often testing if different operators measured the same items several different times, did the operators get the same results. A good way to remember these terms is there is an E in repeatability for equipment and an O in reproducibility for operator. Now, click Next to learn about the tests. So, the last item on the list refers to the two tests that you can conduct to determine the amount of variation caused by a measurement system. They are the Test Retest Study and the Gauge Repeatability and Reproducibility Study. A Test Retest Study can look only at repeatability, meaning it can tell you how much variation in your data is due to an inappropriate device. The advantage of Gauge R&R is that it can separate the individual effects of repeatability from those of reproducibility. Basically, it shows not only variation due to the gauge, but also how much variation is due to the operators. This allows you to take action to fix the problem. For example, if you found a large amount of variation due to operator, you might improve operator training or the procedure descriptions. For this reason, we are going to conduct a gauge R&R for the commercial loan sales case. It takes some time to collect the gauge R&R data, so I'm going to get that process started now. While I do, click Next and I'll tell you how it is being set up. There are three components to a gauge R&R test. Operators, parts, and trials. The operator, as you know, is the person operating the measuring device. It is recommended that you run the test using a minimum of three operators. The more operators you have, the more certainty you will have that your procedures are universally understandable. The part is whatever product or process is being measured. It is recommended that you provide at least 10 representative parts. By representative, I mean that the parts being tested should reflect the range of measurements possible. It is also important that the operators are all measuring the same 10 parts. The trial is each time the item is measured. A minimum of three trials per part, per operator, is recommended and the part should be presented in random order to avoid any influence in the individual measurements. Click Next to learn about the gauge R&R data for our case. 